Okay, as the lights are going down, I guess it's a cue to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome along to my talk about a hacker's guide to Kubernetes and the cloud. Um, I started getting involved in Kubernetes security uh, about two years ago now. It was about sort of middle of 2016. And I got involved with it the same way as I get involved with most new technologies, which is a customer said, um, hey, we'd like you to review the security of our Kubernetes cluster. They were a pretty early adopter, obviously. Uh, and my boss said, well, you know about Docker, uh, so you go and talk to them about Kubernetes too. So I went and found out what Kubernetes did before I talked to them. Uh, and since then, we've seen, obviously, like everyone else, we've seen an amazing growth of Kubernetes usage, which means we're seeing more security reviews, um, which means we're finding stuff about how de people deploy Kubernetes. We're also starting to see people attack Kubernetes deployments in the real world. Uh, and that's some of what this is as well. So what I want to cover today is I'm going to talk about um, Thing, ways we've seen that people break into Kubernetes clusters, ways we've broken into Kubernetes clusters, but also some ways in which you can think about security to try and um, help you kind of focus your efforts, right? There's a huge amount to do in security. You could spend an, an awful lot of time you don't have doing it. So really what this is trying to do is to say, here's some ways to think about it, some things you can do or shouldn't do um, to try and make sure you're as secure as you can be in the time you've got available. Uh, so, very quick about me, um, I have been in information IT security for 18 years. Um, I've been like in financial services, consultancy, a variety of other things. Last 13 years, I've been an ethical hacker slash pen tester slash security tester, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm a managing consultant at a company called NCC. We do security testing and various other security things uh, around the world. I'm also a contributor at Security Stack Exchange. Uh, if you don't know it, um, it's kind of like Stack Overflow, but much smaller and kind of friendlier and focused on security. So if, if you want to ask security questions, it's actually not a bad place to go. Uh, I'm also a contributing author to the CIS, Docker, and Kubernetes standards. Um, one of the things I noticed when I got started looking at, at this uh, a couple of years ago, there, now there are doc there's documentation about it. Back then, there really wasn't. Uh, so luckily, a CIS standard got started up and um, it is actually you know, kept up to date fairly well, and it has a lot of good information. I'll talk a bit about it later on if I get time. So, on with the talk. Oh, because I'm a security tester, and we're keeping the nautical theme going, uh, this is where I live, which is Loch Gaelhead in the Scottish Highlands, and that's the Hebridean Princess going across the loch. It's very nice when it's not raining. So, what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about threat modeling. Right, threat modeling is a really important thing to understand if you're going to do security. Uh, you can waste a lot of time if you don't understand your threat model, uh, and you can also miss things if you don't understand it. So we're gonna talk a bit about threat models. We're gonna talk a bit about attack surface. Knowing what your attack surface is, is again super important, because if you don't know what you have to defend, you don't know where to put your security efforts, and then someone breaks into some area that you didn't even consider. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we are gonna talk about how external attackers might break into your clusters. So people roaming the internet, what are they going to do to try and break in? We're then gonna talk about compromised container reviews. One of the things we've found that a lot of customers are asking us for is they're saying, take the position of an app container that's been compromised and see what you can do to the rest of the cluster. Can you take it, can you become cluster admin? Can you compromise that? Can you maybe even compromise the cloud account that underlies the whole thing? Um, so there's some stuff to think about there. And then, because there's no point in me just telling you it's all terrible and how all broken it is, uh, I'll give you a top 10 of things you can do. This may not end up being your top 10, but it's one idea of where you could start. So, threat model. What is a threat model? So, at a very basic level, if, um, if someone says to you, um, when people come and ask, they ask questions in the Security Stack Exchange, and they'll say things like, is this secure? Or is this insecure? I start every single answer with, it depends. Because it depends. There's no such thing as perfect security. There's no such thing as perfect insecurity. You can have the most vulnerable system on the internet. If no one ever attacks it, it doesn't matter. It's not really insecure, is it? Someone has to attack it to exploit the insecurity. To give you kind of a, a good example, say you had a website. It was really well coded, really well designed, really well tested, lots of security authorization, authentication controls, firewalls, all that great stuff. From an internet perspective, that system's quite secure. If you install it on a server in an open office, which has public access in an unlocked cabinet, against an attacker who can walk in, pick up the box, and walk out the door, it's not very secure. So your threat model matters. If you have to worry about physical attackers, you need to do stuff there. If you don't, maybe you don't. So what threat models do you have to worry about if you're rolling out Kubernetes, especially if you're rolling it out in the cloud? 
The first thing to think about is your random internet attackers. Your people who are scouring the internet looking for systems to compromise. They don't really necessarily want to compromise you, they just want to compromise some system anywhere on the internet. Now, the thing about them is, um, I, people will say a couple of things when I say about this. They'll say, they'll never find me, right? The internet is a huge place. How are they going to find my system to try and compromise it? Yeah, they'll find you, and they'll find you pretty quickly. Uh, the recent, most recent stat I saw on this, uh, a guy put up a, um, a server on the internet. He didn't advertise it. He didn't put any public website on it. it within 24 hours, he had about 1,000 IP addresses contacting him and scanning him. So you pretty much guaranteed you have a less than 24 hour window before you put a service online on the internet before it is found and people are trying to attack it potentially. So there's that. The other thing people will say was, well, my system doesn't really have anything of value, right? I don't have any personal data, I'm not a bank. Why would someone want to attack it? The answer is that every single system you roll on the internet has something of value and that's compute resource. Compute resource equals money because people will work out how to monetize servers the latest wheeze this year is obviously crypto coin mining. So every single compute resource on the internet equals the opportunity to mine crypto coin. So they can directly translate a compromise of your server into money. As long as people can do that, they're going to continue to attack you, right? And if that dies off for whatever reason, they'll come up with something else. It was ransomware before it was crypto coin, before that it was spamming. You know, there's always a reason to try and use a system. So you are a target and you do have to worry about this. Where these attackers, the sort of things they're going to do, it's going to be one-shot attacks. It's going to be quick, it's going to be fast, it's going to be automated. They're not going to spend a lot of time on your particular system because there's another 100,000 to get to next. So something that can be done in a one-shot um, is typically the kind of thing you'll see. But they are actually, they come up with some quite clever one-shots, so you can't dismiss this as very low level. So that's your, your random internet attackers. You might also need to worry about targeted attackers, people who actually want to take out you. Now again, you might think, well, are these people really going to come after me? If you're a bank, so if you're Monzo, we had Monzo presentation yesterday, if you're a bank, obviously you're a target, right? That's a no-brainer. You have the facility to send large amounts of money internationally. Therefore, bad guys would love to do that. They will target you. But there's lots of other reasons you might get targeted. Say, for example, you offer software as a service. Say you offer something like document translation. One of your customers is a law firm or a pharmaceutical firm, and they ask you to translate documents that have commercial value. Well, at that point, the attacker might attack you to get the documents. They don't actually care about you. They care about what you're processing. Say, for sake of argument, you are a supplier to a large corporate. Attackers have worked out that going after the hardened perimeter of, say, a defense company is a really bad idea. Attacking their supplier, who's got a trusted relationship with them and can get into their network, is a really easy idea. So you might be a supplier. There's a variety, or you might even just host someone who people don't like. Linode, for example, they got compromised because they were hosting an IRC server and someone else didn't like the people who used the IRC server. And they compromised Linode just to get the IRC server and take it out. So there's a whole reason, load of reasons why a targeted attacker might come after you. Targeted attackers tend to be more dedicated. So they might sign up for your platform, they might get an account. If you offer containers as part of your platform, they might get a container and see what they can do. They might do things like register, they might sign up, they do all sorts of things, but basically they're gonna spend more time on attacking you. So if you've gotta worry about targeted attackers, you have to worry about people who will spend some time trying to break in. Last group I'm gonna mention in passing, nation state. Um, you can't escape reading security news without reading about cyber war. Um, if you are a target of a nation state attacker and you're only finding out from me telling you in this presentation, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, nation state attackers can use, uh, deploy a large quantity of resources. Realistically speaking, if you are anything to do with critical national infrastructure in your country, you should be in contact with your country's authorities who should be helping you coordinate your defenses, right? You shouldn't be in my presentation finding out about it. So very much, if you're not already, go and talk to them because if you are actually a target of these guys, that could be quite bad. So um, having talked about who might attack you, let's talk about where they might attack you. Um, attack surface is a really important concept because you need to defend across your entire attack surface, right? There's loads of different places people can attack and you should try and think of as many of them as possible because you might miss one. Uh, the second most important slide in this presentation is this one. It doesn't look like it, but it is. So the critical point about attack surface is if you don't spend a load of time on like one element, so you see some nice high, so imagine that attacks cut as waves coming over the side of this boat. Don't spend huge amounts of time on these ones at the edge and miss one in the middle. 
So for example, you could spend a lot of time sorting out a great authorization scheme, sorting out great encryption for all your services, and then you might, one of your developers might leave an AWS uh, admin a key on GitHub, right? And that's that little, little bit there. And they're gonna come in over the easy bit. You have to be consistent across your entire attack surface. And that's really important because attackers, they don't care about all the stuff you spent loads of time on. They'll find the one bit you didn't and try there. So understanding what you have to attack obviously is key because otherwise you don't know where to spend your effort. Uh, cloudy clusters, um, AWS, Azure, GCP, you are deploying in the cloud. The cloud is part of your cluster's attack surface. If someone can compromise an AWS token, an, AZ, uh, an Azure token, any of these things, they can use that to try and break into your cluster. IAM rules are important, security groups are important, so you can't just focus purely on Kubernetes. Uh, you actually have to think about the cloud as well because the cloud getting compromised will give you a bad day. Other means of acquiring access, GitHub. GitHub's a great way of acquiring access. Um, so GitHub have worked out that things like AWS keys get posted by accident on GitHub repos. Uh, so they scan for those. They don't, however, and can't scan for every type of secret because they just don't know what they all look like. I have already, I mean, we, we do assessments, some of these assessments for customers. Um, one of the problems we've seen is that, um, does anyone here, do their organizations use private repos on GitHub to develop? No? Yeah, okay, so some people. So the problem, the pattern we've seen that might happen is you have a private repo for your company, a developer clones the repo to do work. They then want to fork it and do some work on it, and they think, well, I don't want to commit this back to the main repository yet, I'll just put it in my personal account. Their personal account isn't private, it's public. Now, obviously, none of us store secrets in any GitHub repos, right? In, under no circumstances, right, are there SSH keys, AWS keys, or anything else in GitHub repos? Right, okay. Um, this was a very naive search I did, uh, which is just basically look for something called config and look for some of the things you would find in a cube config file, uh, of which there were 200. And that was at least a one-time search. Uh, I didn't go trying any of these, obviously, because I have a white hat on and I don't go doing that because it's dubious legally. Um, but it could be that there are people's cube config files sitting up on GitHub. And bad guys know to go and scan GitHub. GitHub is a common point of intelligence gathering for attackers because they know that they can find secrets and they know that they can find keys and they're gonna go here and they're gonna look through it. So GitHub is part of your attack surface, right? You need to understand what is on GitHub or, or GitLab or whatever other cloud code repository you use. People do know how to search for this stuff and they will find it. The other thing that is part of your attack surface is um, all your developers' laptops. Uh, developers have got keys, keys live on laptops so that they can have access to things. If a laptop goes missing, gets lost, gets stolen, you need to work out how am I gonna make sure that none of those keys live beyond the person reporting it and saying, hey, my laptop's gone missing, I left it at Starbucks and I came back and someone's yanked it, right? That, you don't want to turn that into a really bad day, but that's part of your attack surface, right? Depending on the type of attacker again. So if you're super targeted, someone might actually follow one of your developers into Starbucks and like steal their laptop when they're not looking. This does happen, depends on who you are, what kind of company you've got, what's your threat model. So. Let's look up, talk about actually breaking into Kubernetes now. Let's talk about how people can actually try and compromise Kubernetes. Um, if I'm an external attacker and I'm trying to break into a cluster, the very first thing I will always do is port scan, right? A port scanner is finding all the network services running. Um, and I'm trying to find out what is the attack surface of this cluster? What are my points of compromise? If you do that to a Kubernetes cluster, you'll get something that looks a little bit like this. It will be a little bit variable. So we've got a lot of the common services you'd expect to see. Um, various for network plugins, because network plugins have got an attack surface. Most of them have got some kind of listing network service. Some of them are not authenticated. You do need to watch for that. Um, so there's lots of different ways in. And I'll kind of, kind of cover some of the main ones, ways you can break in. Uh, the API server is the obvious target, right? Everyone has the API server. If, if someone can get access to the API server, it's gonna have a bad time. Luckily, the default for the API service is that it's authenticated. Unless you have the insecure port listening, um, luckily, that's been deprecated. I think 110 deprecates the insecure port, which is fantastic, because it's, it's, it's the keys in the name, right? Insecure port, don't enable that. And you'd think you'd never see this enabled. I will say, I did, when I was learning about this stuff, I did various installs of various different clusters, and I found at least some cloud providers, not on the external network, but on the uh, container network, had the insecure port running. So anyone who got any kind of container was just, could, could just hit the insecure port and ta-da, your cluster admin. So don't necessarily assume that, that that's gonna be turned off everywhere, it should be. And again, 110 deprecates, so hopefully it will go away. Um, I'm not gonna mention 
put up the, the Tesla screenshot because it's been up there loads of times. Obviously, you can turn off authentication. And this is kind of a good example of, of, of what happens if you get this stuff wrong. It's not just the loss. It's the fact that Tesla are going to be doomed to being part of security presentations about Kubernetes for years to come. That screenshot that I'm sure you've seen has been on a couple of other presentations. It will come up forever. So what about etcd? Um, etcd is um, the database that powers Kubernetes. And it has a lot of sensitive and secret information in it. It is possible to have it available unauthenticated. Um, it has quite a kind of straightforward authentication model where it's basically you have a client certificate that it recognizes and it lets you in. But that's not, again, not turned on by default on every cluster. I have seen cases, and we have compromised clusters as part of assignments, where basically it was as simple as using etcd and just downloading the database. To give you, because I'm mad, I'm going to try it. Let's try a demo. Am I doing it for time? I'm doing it for time. I can do demos. Cool. So let's do a really quick demo. Uh, so if you have etcd and it is unauthenticated, uh, you can do something like that. And that basically says, give me every single key in the Kubernetes data store. And all you need to do then is basically look through looking for stuff that says secret in it. Uh, and once you find stuff that says secret in it, you can do something like that. And that's your token. Right, so there's your service token. Very, very simple. Some of these etcd open. This thing down the bottom is your token. Uh, and then once you've got that, let's clear that because it's going to be messy otherwise. You can do, 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 do that one. And that's just applying the token as a bearer in a curl header. So no fancy stuff, just curl. And yay, I'm authenticated to the API server. In that case, this cluster doesn't have RBAC on, so I'm a customer admin. So that's game over for that cluster, right? I got the etcd. It took me, what, three commands? Uh, I'm now cluster admin, and that's my assignment done, and that's great. So I have a good time if I see that on a cluster on a job. So etcd is super important to make sure that that is authenticated and locked down, and it's not one of the as well-known ones. The other thing to mention at this point is Shodan. Uh, has anyone heard of Shodan? Yeah, some people have heard of Shodan. If you haven't heard of Shodan, Shodan is like Google, but it's for services on the internet. So if you think that people can't find your stuff on the internet, Shodan scans the internet every day for an ever-increasing number of services and ports, and it indexes them all in a really nice, friendly web front end that also is an API. So you can scan the internet. For, you can scan around and say, hey, give me everything that has a port open. To give you an example, this is etcd. There are 1,874 etcd servers on the internet uh, last time when I searched this. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the stuff down the right, um, it sometimes it's actually telling you stuff like peers. It wouldn't do this if it, wasn't, if it couldn't authenticate. Right? That's people's clusters. That's 1,874 either etcd instances or clusters that are probably unauthenticated. Uh, now, I didn't connect to any of these because, again, white hat, don't want to go to jail, don't lose my job. Luckily for me, there are researchers who don't really mind that kind of thing quite so much. So a guy did a post called the foot gun of etcd. He didn't even know it had anything to do with Kubernetes at the time. He basically did this and then downloaded all the databases. And he found loads of passwords, keys, everything else. This is people's cluster databases. Uh, and there are 1,874 of them currently sitting online uh, waiting for people to attack. If you don't get this stuff right by default, you have a probably fairly small window between before someone comes and tries to do this to you. Once attackers, it's kind of like a shark metaphor, once attackers smell blood in the water, once they get the idea, it's like why MongoDB got attacked again and again on the internet, because it got the reputation for being installed unauthenticated. So the attackers went, oh, that's a good target. We'll, we'll scan up a bot, we'll, we'll code up a bot for that. We'll have it scan the internet, find places to attack. If people get the idea that that's possible, they will do it, and then they'll start downloading stuff and compromising clusters. So yeah, Shodan is super cool, uh, but a bit scary at times. So the other one that, that is, it's worth mentioning um, is Kubelet, right? So back in the old days uh, of about 18 months ago, um, the Kubelet couldn't be authenticated. There was no authentication for the Kubelet. Basically, if you get to the port, you could um, execute commands. What the, having access to the Kubelet API will do is it will allow you to execute any command in any container running on that node. Right? with the privileges of the Docker engine, or whatever container runtime engine you're running. So basically, if I can get to the Kubelet API, it's pretty much inevitable that I'll compromise that node. And depending on where I can go from there, it's pretty likely I'll get the whole cluster. Not every default installer will put authentication on the Kubelet. So it's really important to check, if you're using one of the distributions, that they are putting authentication on the Kubelet, because otherwise, bad things can happen like this. So let's do this one's even easier. Uh, da, 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 da. So I've got my kubelet running, and all I need to do here is I say basically, go get kube system, kube API server, and run that command. Uh, and it says, of course. 
there's the private key for the CA for the cluster. Right? So I can now issue new certificates or do anything else I want. That's basically game over for that cluster. Single command. Well, you'd have to do one more command to find out what the name of the uh, API server pod was. But, but realistically speaking, it's extremely simple to compromise a cluster. And again, we've seen clusters where we're getting paid to do pen tests. So companies that understand that security is a thing, they don't realize that the kubelet is necessarily unauthenticated by default sometimes. And you can leave it open, and then it's very short order to get the cluster compromise. So kubelet, yeah. Securing the kubelet is super important. What about malicious containers? So, the thing about Kubernetes is it runs a lot of services, right? It doesn't just run, it's not designed just to run one workload. It's designed to run many workloads. So realistically speaking, the more workloads you run on it, the more ports and services you're exposing to the outside world, the bigger your attack surface. So there's more places for an attacker to attack. And you have to realistically expect that at some point they're going to get lucky with an app vulnerability, and they're going to compromise one container inside your cluster. You don't want that to be game over for your whole cluster. That's, that's not a good set, setup to have. Um, what do you get in terms, if, if I'm an attacker and I get my, my position inside a container, what do I get out of that? I get access to the container file system. So if you were in uh, uh, Liz Rice's keynote this morning and you saw how people could mount the root file system, obviously they do that and you get the container file system, then it's going to be game over really quickly. Um, that's one option, I'll show you another. Uh, you get an internal network position. Right? So you get access to the container network rather than have to come from the outside world. I can scan from the container network out the way. That tends to expose a lot more services. There's a lot more to attack usually. People don't firewall that way around. Uh, and I get kernel attacks. So unless you're using something like cat containers or, um, or Gvisor, I can attack the Linux kernel. Uh, attacking service account tokens. So service account tokens are... Um, th they were one of the things that surprised me most when I started looking at Kubernetes, coming from my like, security person's background. Someone said to me, oh yeah, if you run a, uh, just run a container, then you can just execute kubectl commands, and it'll just be like whatever writes. And, and before Arbat came along, you'll be cluster admin. I said, really? You're joking. Um, and I tried it, and it works. So the problem is, unless you have Arbat deployed, and you are mounting service tokens in, you're mounting a cluster admin token inside every single container. That means anyone who gets access is literally one command away, download kubectl, or just use curl and use the, apply the token the way I did with the bearer, from getting cluster admin access to your cluster. That's not good. Um, service tokens definitely, yeah, are a dangerous thing. I understand why they won't, but the idea of the game that they're, all, they're always on by default, right? So every cluster I've ever seen, I've ever deployed, I've ever looked at, loads up service tokens by default. So they're going to be there. Leveraging access in the cloud. The other point about um, people attacking from the point of view of a con compromised container is it isn't necessarily just a bad day for your cluster. It could be a bad day for your whole cloud account. So once you're inside, say I'm running in AWS as an example. Once I'm running inside a container, I can hit, generally hit the AWS metadata service. So the AWS, if you don't know about it, it's on a predictable IP address, 169.254, 169.254. If you can hit that, you can get access to the IAM token for the EC2 instance you're running on. Depending on how many rights you've given that IAM profile, you might be able to compromise someone's entire cluster account, uh, sorry, entire cloud account, and we have done this. So if you apply a lot of rights to EC2, and if you, for example, it, older versions of COPS is better now, but older versions of COPS gave pretty wide rights to, the, to their account. So if you could hit, if you got inside the cluster, you could get pretty good access to the AWS. I think even now, there are some rights you could use to do things like create new EC2 instances. So if I can get access to one container, I can hit the metadata service and start spinning up EC2 instances. If my goal is to try and um, mine CryptoCoin, that could be quite valuable. So, you have to think about the fact that people can get from your containers and go and do other things. Uh, now we come to the most important slide in the entire deck. Uh, you've heard me say the words um, by default quite a lot over the last 23 minutes. Ooh, running out of time. Um, security faults are critically important. Once things go into production, Settings don't change so much, right? Because changing settings has implications. It can knock over your production workloads. It can mean you have to do rework. Things going in to, to fix stuff before it goes into production. Get the defaults right. I've been in security 18 years. We're still living with the legacy of things like admin admin as being a default login for various management services. I still compromise accounts, compromise systems using admin admin because it was a default, right? And defaults don't change. So getting security default and don't assume that whatever Kubernetes distribution or cloud provider you choose to use has the same threat model that you've got. 
right? They don't know your threat model. They don't know what you're worried about. They can make assumptions and they can say, here are our defaults. That's not necessarily going to be totally secure, right? Not all the time. Um, definitely, I got some surprises when looking at the default settings. Um, things weren't quite as secure as I thought they were going to be, or locked down as I thought they were going to be. So it's really, really, really important. If you, think, if you remember nothing else other than Scottish accent, pirate pictures, that, there you go, good presentation. Um, yeah, remember that. So key security considerations. This is a quick run through the top 10 of things I would recommend you look at first. In secure port, turn it off. If you're running 110 and above, it's deprecated for you, so you don't need to worry about it. Do not run the insecure port. There's really no reason, and it's incredibly dangerous. Control access to the kubelet. Do not allow unauthenticated access to the kubelet. You will have a bad time. Um, turn off the read-only port as well. It's not as bad, but the read-only port still provides a whole lot of information that attackers would find super useful. So it isn't going to cause compromise on its own, but when I see it, that's the first thing I do, read all that stuff, find out what's going on. Seed Advisor as well. I think Seed Advisor is getting deprecated too. Um, control access to SED. If people can get unauthenticated access to your SED, you're going to have a really bad time. Make sure that that is the certificate authority and everything else is set up before you go going. Restrict service token use. So for me, I don't know whether I mean you guys run production clusters. I don't. What percentage of containers actually need Kubernetes API access? I don't think it's that high. So I turn the default round and say, hey, let's not mount service tokens unless we actually need them, rather than mount them every single time and having to not. That would be my way around to looking at that. If you do mount service tokens all the time, uh, make sure you have RBAC switched on. Otherwise, yeah, cluster admin tokens everywhere. Ew. Restrict privileged containers. So again, if you were in uh, the talk this morning, there was some of the dangers of privileged containers. Privileged containers are super dangerous. Um, I tell you now that when all this other easy stuff gets locked down, like SED and Kubelet, the next place I'm going to start attacking, and the next place attackers are start attacking, is anything that runs as privileged. Because if we can compromise the service running in a privileged container, we're going to get access to the underlying node, and from there it's much easier to get access to the overall cluster. So anything you've got running as privileged, consider that a dangerous thing. Especially things like network plugins, which tend to run as privileged and have a network attack footprint. That, I, I, you know, I haven't seen weaknesses in them yet, but I tell you that's where I would go if I was a bad guy. I'd be going after the network plugins because they, they run on every single node and they run as privileged, so they're dangerous. So be careful of anything privileged. API server authentication. Um, yeah, don't allow anonymous off. It, there, there is, I mean, I basically would recommend for end users, don't use certificate auth because there's no way of, of, of invalidating a certificate. So that's one of the problems. If you, so, so OIDC or something like that, some other form of authentication, but make sure that's turned on and enabled. Use RBAC. Definitely use RBAC or other alternatives, but RBAC if nothing else. Um, but yeah, that absolutely needs to happen. Pod security policy. Uh, if you are at all worried about um, any of your users, like you don't want to easily give your users cluster admin access, you want to like lock people down to specific areas, you really need a pod security policy because you need to stop them doing things like mounting in the root file system off the underlying node, right? So you need a pod security policy, definitely. Network policy, network policy is super cool. Um, you can do things like stop containers getting access to the control plane, right? Why should containers necessarily need to be able to contact the kubelet? Probably they shouldn't. So you can use network policy with the correct plugin to block egress. Not all of them support egress filtering, worth noting. Uh, regular upgrades. This one will, it's been mentioned once or twice, but this one will come back and bite. One of the problems with Kubernetes, when I look at it from my, my old school enterprise hat on, is the idea of having to completely re-roll a cluster every nine months at most, probably more frequently than that, to keep supported. It's gonna be a bit of a challenge. Um, but you need to do it because if you get a security update, you're going to need to do it quickly. So get used to the idea of doing regular upgrades. Honorable mention, it's not my top 10, cloud rights. Um, be very careful what rights are available to your container and uh, cluster components because if you give too many and an attacker compromises your cluster, you don't want that to turn into a bad day for your whole cloud account because that could be a really super bad day with billing and um, implications. Resources. People in other presentations have done lots. I'll just mention this one. This is a CIS guide. Uh, it's very long. It has 270 something odd pages in it. Um, one thing to note is the way we wrote this was we went through every single setting in Kubernetes that could vaguely have to do with security and said this is the secure option. So don't try and like get 100% passing rate. I'm not even sure a cluster would work if you did. 
but, but look at it as a thing to go through and say, here are some ideas I can consider. Consider what it's saying and say, hey, you know, is that good or bad? And don't let an auditor tell you you have to get 100% on it either. Um, give, them, give them my email address, I'll tell them why that's a bad idea. Conclusion, default security options are super, super important. They are the most important thing. Get it right before you go into production and you will have a much better life. Always think about your threat model and attack surface, right? When you're thinking about where you want to spend your effort, um, if you don't have to worry about internal attackers, then spend less time doing controls that matter to them. Spend more time doing controls that matter to the kind of people who are likely to attack you. Internet noise is a guaranteed, so make sure you don't have any of the kind of stuff they're going to scan for. Targeted attackers is a bit of a more nuanced conversation. And get the basics right. There's been lots, of, um, lots and lots of presentations. I was really pleasantly surprised about how many, much security stuff is ongoing. Some of it's really cool, but I wouldn't necessarily start there. Get the basics right first get stuff locked down, get authentication switched on everywhere um, before going on and then like, doing those more advanced topics. Oh, dead on the money. We've got, I think, a couple of minutes for questions. So do we have any questions? Ooh, thank you. <laughs> Presentation, by the way, is up on GitHub, and it's also in Docker Hub. So it's a, yeah, it's a Docker container, obviously. So any questions? No? Nope. I can hardly see, so just shout them out if you can. Oh, lights are up, now I can see. No questions, fantastic. In that case, thank you very much. Yeah.